Cohesion by Veronica Roth, Chapter 39, Triss. Matthew clasps his hands behind his back. No, no, the serum doesn't erase all of a person's knowledge, he says. Do you think we would design a serum that makes people forget how to speak or walk? He shakes his head. It targets explicit memories, like your name, where you grew up, your first teacher's name, and leaves implicit memories, like how to speak or tie your shoes or ride a bicycle, untouched. Interesting, Kara says. That actually works. Tobias and I exchange a look. There's nothing like a conversation between an erudite and someone who may as well be an erudite. Kara and Matthew are standing too close together, and the longer they talk, the more hand gestures they make. Inevitably, some important memories will be lost, Matthew says. But if we have a record of people's scientific discoveries or histories, they can relearn them in a hazy period after their memories are erased. People are very pliable then. I lean against the wall. Wait, I say. If the Bernou is going to load all of those plants with the memory serum virus to reset the experiments, will there be any serum left to use against the compound? We'll have to get it first, Matthew says, in less than 48 hours. Kara doesn't appear to hear what I said. After you erase their memories, won't you have to program them with new memories? How's that work? We just have to reattach them, reteach them. As I said, people tend to be disoriented for a few days after being reset, which means they'll be easier to control. Matthew sits and spins in his chair once. We can just give them a new history class, one that teaches facts rather than propaganda. We could use the fringes slide to show the supplement a basic history lesson, I say. They have photographs of a war caused by GPs. Great, Matthew nods. Big problem, though. The memory serum virus is in the weapons lab. The one Nita just tried and failed to break into. Christine and I were supposed to talk to Reggie, Tobias says. But I think, given this new plan, we should talk to Nita instead. I think you're right, I say. Let's go find where she went wrong. When I first arrived here, I felt like the compound was huge and unknowable. Now I don't even have to consult the signs to remember how to get to the hospital, and neither does Tobias who keeps stride with me on the way. It's strange how time makes a place shrink, makes its strangeness ordinary. We don't say anything to each other, though I can feel a conversation brewing between us. Finally, I decide to ask. What's wrong? I say. You hardly said anything during the meeting. I just... He shakes his head. I'm not sure this is the right thing to do. They want to erase our friend's memory, so we decide to erase theirs? I turn to him and touch his shoulders lightly. Tobias, we have 48 hours to stop them. If you can think of any other idea, anything else that could save our city, I'm open to it. I can't. His dark blue eyes look defeated, sad. But we're acting out of desperation to save something that's important to us, just like the Buryu is. What's the difference? The difference is what's right, I say firmly. The people in the city as a whole are innocent. The people in the Buryu who supplied Janine with the attack simulation are not innocent. His mouth puckers and I can tell he doesn't completely buy it. I sigh. It's not a perfect situation, but when you have to choose between two bad options, you pick the one that saves the people you love and believe in most. You just do, okay? He reaches for my hand, his hand warm and strong. Okay. Triss! Christina pushes through the swinging doors to the hospital and jogs toward us. Peter is on her heels, his dark hair combed smoothly to the side. At first I think she's excited, and I feel a swell of hope. What if Uriah is awake? But the closer she gets, the more obvious it is that she isn't excited. She's frantic. Peter lingers behind her, his arms crossed. I just spoke to one of the doctors, she says breathless. The doctor says Uriah is not going to wake up. Something about no brain waves. A weight settles on my shoulders. I knew, of course, that Uriah might never wake up, but the hope that kept the grief uh, at bay is dwindling, slipping away with each word she speaks. They were going to take him off life support right away, but I pleaded with them. She wipes one of her eyes fiercely with the heel of her hand, catching a tear before it falls. Finally, the doctor said he would give me four days so I can tell his family. His family. Zeke is still in the city, and so is their dauntless mother. It never occurred to me before that they don't know what happened to him, and we never bothered to tell them, because we were all so focused on... You're going to reset the city in 48 hours, I say suddenly, and I grab Tobias' arm. He looks stunned. 
If we can't stop them, that means Zeke and his mother will forget him. They'll forget him before they have a chance to say goodbye to him. It will be like he never existed. What? Christina demands, her eyes wide. My family is in there. They can't reset everyone. How could they do that? Pretty easy, actually, Peter says. I'd forgotten that he was there. What are you doing here? I demand. I want to see Uriah, he says. Is there a law against it? You didn't even care about him, I spit. What right do you have? Triss. Christina shakes her head. Not now, okay? Tobias hesitates, his mouth open like there are words waiting on his tongue. We have to go in, he says. Matthew said we could inculate people against the memory serum, right? So we'll go in, inculate Uriah's family just in case, and take them back to the compound to say goodbye to him. We have to do it tomorrow, though, or it will be too late. He pauses. And you can inculate your family too, Christina. I should be the one who tells Zeke and Hanno anyway. Christina nods and I squeeze her arm in an attempt at reassurance. I'm going too, Peter says, unless you want me to tell David what you're planning. We all pause to look at him. I don't know what Peter wants with a journey into the city, but it can't be good. At the same time, we can't afford for David to find out what we're doing. Not now, when there's no time. Fine, Tobias says. But if you cause any trouble, I'll reserve the right to knock you unconscious and lock you in an abandoned building somewhere. Peter rolls his eyes. How do we get there? Christina says. It's not like they just let people borrow cars. I bet we could get Amar to take you, I say. He told me today that he always volunteers for patrols, so he knows all the right people. And I'm sure he would agree to help your eye and his family. I should go ask him now, and if, and someone should probably sit with Uriah and make sure that the doctor doesn't go back on his word. Christina, not Peter. Tobias rubs the back of his neck, pawing at the Dauntless tattoo like he wants to tear it from his body. And then I should figure out how to tell Uriah's family that he got killed when I was supposed to be looking out for him. Tobias, I say, but he holds up a hand to stop me. He starts to move away. They probably won't let me visit Nita anyway. Sometimes it's, hard to tell, sometimes it's hard to know how to take care of people. As I watch Peter and Tobias walk away, keeping their distance from each other, I think it's possible that Tobias needs someone to run after him, because people have been letting him walk away, letting him withdraw, his entire life. But he's right. He needs to do this for Zeke, and I need to t talk to Nita. Come on, Christina says. Visiting hours are almost over, and I'm going to go back to sit with Uriah. Before I go to Nita's room, identifiable by the security guard sitting by the door, I stop by Uriah's room with Christina. She sits in the chair next to him, which is creased with, ca with contours of her legs. It's been a long time since I've spoken to her like a friend, a long time since we've laughed together. I was lost in the fog of the Bergu and the promise of belonging. I stand next to her and look at him. He doesn't really look injured anymore. There are some bruises, some cuts, but nothing serious enough to kill him. I tell my head to see the snake tattoo wrapped around his ear. I know it's him, but he doesn't look much like Uriah without a wide smile on his face and his dark eyes bright, alert. He and I weren't really even that close, she says, just at the very end, because he had lost someone who died and so had I. I know, I say. You really helped him. I drag a chair over to sit next to her. She clutches Uriah's hand, which stays limp on the sheets. Sometimes I just feel like I've lost all my friends, she says. You haven't lost Kara, I say, or Tobias, and Christina, you haven't lost me. You'll never lose me. She turns to me, and somewhere in the haze of grief, we wrap our arms around each other in the same desperate way we did when she told me she had forgiven me for killing Will. Our friendship had hel has held up under an incredible weight, the weight of me shooting someone she loved, the weight of so many losses. Other bonds would have broken. For some reason, this one hasn't. We stay clutched together for a long time until the desperation fades. Thanks, she says. You won't lo lose me either. I'm pretty sure if I was going to, I would have already. I smile. Listen, I have some things to catch you up on. I tell her about our plan to stop the Bergu from resetting the experiments. As I speak, I think of the people she stands to lose. Her father and mother, her sister. All those connections, forever altered or discarded in the name of genetic purity. I'm sorry, I say when I'm finished. I know you probably want to help us, but don't be sorry. She stares at Uriah. I'm still glad I'm going into the city. She nods a few times. 
You'll stop them from resetting the experiment. I know you will. I hope she's right. I only have ten minutes until visiting hours are over when I arrive at Nita's room. The guard looks up from his back from his book and raises his eyebrows at me. Can I go in? I say. Not really supposed to let people in there, he says. I'm the one who shot her, I say. Does that count for anything? Well, he shrugs. As long as you promise not to shoot her again and get out within ten minutes. It's a deal. He has me take off my jacket to show that I'm not carrying any weapons, and then he lets me into the room. Nita jerks to attention as much as she can, anyway. Half of her body is encased in plaster, and one of her hands is cuffed to the bed, as if she could escape even if she wanted to. Her hair is messy, knotted, but of course she's still pretty. What are you doing here? She says. I don't answer. I check the corners of the room for cameras, and there's one across from me, pointed at Nita's hospital bed. There aren't mark microphones, she says. They don't really do that here. Good. I pull up a chair and sit beside her. I'm here because I need important information from you. I already told them anything I felt like telling them. She glares at me. I got nothing more to say, especially not to the person who shot me. If I hadn't shot you, I wouldn't be David's favorite person, and I wouldn't know all the things I know. I glare at the door more from paranoia than an actual concern that someone is listening in. We've got a new plan, Matthew and I, and Tobias, and it will require getting into the weapons lab. And you thought I could help you with that? She shakes her head. I couldn't get in the first time, remember? I need to know what the security is like. Is David the only person who knows the passcode? Not like the only person ever, she says. That would be stupid. His superiors know it, but he's the only person in the compound, yes. Okay, then what's the backup security measure, the one that is activated if you explode the doors? She presses her, he her lips together so they almost disappear and stares at the half-body cast covering her. It's the death serum, she says, in aerosol form. It's practically unstoppable. Even if you wear a clean suit or something, it works its way in eventually. It just takes a little bit more time that way. That's what the lab reports say. So they just automatically kill anyone who makes their way into that room without the passcode, I say. It surprises you? I guess not. I bounce my elbow on my knees, and there's no other way in except with David's code. Which, as you found out, he is completely unwilling to share, she says. There's no chance a GP could resist a death serum, I say. No, definitely not. Most GPs can't resist the most GPs can't resist the truth serum either, I say. But I can. If you want to go flirt with death, be my guest. She leans back into the pillows. I'm done with that now. One more question, I say. Say I do want to flirt with death. Where do I get explosives to make, break through the doors? Like I'm going to tell you that. I don't think you get it, I say. If this plan succeeds, you won't be imprisoned for life anymore. You'll recover and you'll go free. So it's in your best interest to help me. She stares at me like she is wedging and measuring, or like she is weighing and measuring me. Her wrists tug at the handcuff, just enough that the metal carves a line into her skin. Reggie has the explosives, she says. He can teach you how to use them, but he's no good in action, so, so for goodness sake, don't bring him along unless you feel like babysitting. Note it, I say. Tell him it will require twice as much firepower to get through those doors than any others. They're extremely sturdy. I nod. My watch beeps on the hour, signaling that my time is up. I stand and push my chair back to the corner where I found it. Thank you for the help, I say. What is the plan? She says, if you don't mind telling me. I pause, hesitating over the words. Well, I say eventually, let's just say it will erase the, fa the phrase genetically damaged from everyone's vocabulary. The guard opens the door, probably to yell at me for overstaying my welcome, but I'm already making my way out. I look over my shoulder just once before going, and I see that Nita is wearing a small smile. Chapter 40. Tobias. Amar agrees to help us get into the city without requiring much persuasion, eager for an adventure as I knew he would be. We agree to meet that evening for dinner to talk through the plan with Christina, Peter, and George, who will help us get a vehicle. After I talk to Amar, I walk to the dormitory and lay with a pillow over my head for a long time. 
cycling through a script of what I will say to Zeke when I see him. I'm sorry. I was doing what I thought I had to do and everyone else was looking after Uriah, and I didn't think. People come into the room and leave it. The heat switched on and pushes through the vents and then turns off again. And all the while, I'm thinking through that script, concocting excuses and then discarding them, choosing the right tone, the right gestures. Finally, I grow, fr I grow frustrated and take the pillow from my face and fling it across the opposite wall. Kara, who is just s smoothing a clean shirt down over her hips, jumps back. I thought you were asleep, she says. Sorry. She touches her hair, ensuring that each strand is secure. She's so careful in her movements, so precise. It reminds me of the Amity musicians plucking at a banjo strings. I have a question. I sit up. It's kind of personal. Okay. She sits across from me on Triss's bed. Ask it. How were you able to forgive Triss after what she did to your brother? I say. Assuming you have, that is. Hmm... Kara hugs her arms close to her body. Sometimes I think I have forgiven her. Sometimes I'm not certain I have. I don't know how. That's like asking how you continue on with your life after someone dies. You just do it, and the next day you do it again. Is there any way she could have made it easier for you? Or any way she did? Why are you asking this? She sets her hand on my knee. Is it because of Uriah? Yes, I say firmly and I shift my leg a little so her hand falls away. I don't need to be patted or consoled, like a child. I don't need her raised eyebrows, her soft voice to, co to coax an emotion from me that I would prefer to contain. Okay. She straightens, and when she speaks again, she sounds casual the way she usually does. I think the most crucial thing she did, admittedly without meaning to, was confess. There is a difference between admitting and confessing. Admitting involves softening making excuses for things that cannot be excused, confessing just names the crime at its full se severity. That was something I needed. I nod. And after you co you've confessed to Zeke, she says, I think it would help if you leave him alone for as long as he wants to be left alone. That's all you can do. I nod again. But for, she adds, you didn't kill Uriah. You didn't set off the bomb that injured him. You didn't make the plan that led to that explosion. But I did participate in the plan. Oh, shut up, would you? She says it gently, smiling at me. It happened. It was awful. You weren't perfect. That's all there is. Don't confuse your grief with guilt. We stay in silence in the loneliness of the otherwise empty dormitory for a few more minutes, and I try to let her words work themselves into me. I eat dinner with Amar, George, Christina, and Peter in the cafeteria between the beverage counter and a row of trash cans. The bowl of soup before me went cold before I could eat all of it, and there, is, um, still, there are still some crackers swimming in the broth. Amar tells us where and when to meet, then we go to the hallway near the kitchen so we won't be seen, and he takes out a small black box with syringes inside it. He gives one to Christina, Peter, and me along with an individually packed antibacterial wipe. Something I suspect only Amar would bother with. What's this? Christina says. I'm not going to inject it into my body unless I know what it is. Fine. Amar folds his hands. There's a chance that we will still be in the city with when a memory serum virus is deployed. You'll need to inculate yourself against it unless you want to forget everything you now remember. It's the same thing you'll be injecting into your family's arms, so don't worry about it. Christina turns her arm over and slaps the inside of her elbow until a vein stands at attention. Out of habit, I stick the needle onto the side of my neck, the same way I did every time I went through my fear landscape, which was several times a week at one point. Amar does the same thing. I notice, however, that Peter only pretends to inject himself when he presses the plunger down. The fluid runs down his throat, and he wipes it casually with his sleeve. I wonder what it feels like to volunteer to forget everything. After dinner, Christina walks up to me and says, we need to talk. We walk down the long flight of stairs that leads to the underground GD space, our knees bouncing in unison with each step, and down the multicolored hallway. At the end, Christina crosses her arms, purple lights playing over her nose and mouth. Amar doesn't know we're going to try to stop the reset, she says. No, I say. He's loyal to the Veru. I don't want to involve him. You know, the city is still on the verge of revolution, she says, and the lights turn blue. The Bergu's whole reason for resetting our friends and families is to stop them from killing each other. 
If we stop the reset, the Allegiant will attack Evelyn. Evelyn will turn the death serum loose, and a lot of people will die. I may still be mad at you, but I don't think you want that many people in the city to die. Your parents in particular. I sighed. Honestly, I don't really care about them. You can't be serious, she says, scowling. They're your parents. I can, actually, I say. I want to tell Zeke and his mother what I did to Uriah. Apart from that, I don't really care what happens to Evelyn and Marcus. You may not care about your permanently messed up family, but you should care about everyone else, she says. She takes my arm into one strong hand and jerks me so that I look at her. For my little sister is in there. If Evelyn and the Allegiance smack into each other, she could get hurt, and I won't be there to protect her. I saw Christina with her family on visiting day when she was still just a loudmouth candor transfer to me. I watched her mother fix the collar of Christina's shirt with a proud smile. If the memory serum virus is developed, that memory will be erased from her mother's mind. If it's not, her family will be caught in the middle of another citywide battle for control. I say, so what are you suggesting we do? She releases me. There has to be a way to prevent a huge blow-up that doesn't involve forcibly erasing everyone's memories. Maybe, I concede. I hadn't thought about it because it didn't seem necessary. But it is necessary, of course. It's necessary. Did you have an idea for how to stop it? It's basically one of your parents against the other one, Christina says. Isn't there something you can say to them that will make them from trying that will stop them from trying to kill each other? Something I can say to them? I say. Are you kidding? They don't listen to anyone. They don't do anything that doesn't directly benefit them. So there's nothing you can do. You're just going to let the city rip itself to shreds. I stare at my shoes, bathed in green light, mulling it over. If I had different parents, if I had reasonable parents, less driven by pain and anger and the desire for revenge, it might work. They might be compelled to listen to their son. Unfortunately, I do not have different parents. But I could. I could if I wanted them. Just a slip of the memory serum in their morning coffee or their evening water, and they would be new people, clean slates, unblemished by history. They would have to be taught that they, that they even had a son to begin with. They would need to learn my name again. It's the same technique we're using to heal the compound. I could use it to heal them. I look at Christina. Get me some memory serum, I say. While you, Amar, and Peter are looking for your family and Uriah's family, I'll take care of it. I probably won't have enough time to get both of my parents, but one of them will do. How will you get away from the rest of us? I need... I don't know. We need a, to add a complication. Something re that requires one of us leaving the pack. What about flat tires? Christina says. We're going at night, right? So I can tell Amar to stop so I can go to the bathroom or something, slash the tires, and then we'll have to split up so you can find another truck. I consider this for a moment. I could tell Amar what's really going on, but that would require undoing the dense knot of propaganda and lies that Bergu has tied in his mind. Assuming I could even do it, we don't have time for that. But we do have time for a well-told lie. Amar knows that my father taught me how to start a car with just the wires when I was younger. He wouldn't question me volunteering to find us another vehicle. That will work, I say. Good. She tilts her head. So you're really going to erase one of your parents' memories? What do you do when your parents are evil? I say. Get a new parent. If one of them doesn't have all the baggage they currently have, maybe the two of them can negotiate a peace agreement or something. She frowns at me for a few seconds like she wants to say something, but eventually she just nods. End of chapter 40.